So alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is under-recognized. We, we certainly know that from many lines of evidence. There's a long interval between when patients first have symptoms and when they're first recognized, first diagnosed as having this condition. That interval of time on average may be as long as seven to eight years. There are two reasons that it matters. These patients, number one, have a genetic condition that predisposes them and their family members, their siblings, their children, even their parents, if recognized early enough, uh, as having uh, being at risk for lung and, in some instances, liver disease. Uh, and there are specific therapies that are available that can slow the progression of the disease. This is a, a progressive uh, loss of lung function and sometimes progressive onset of liver disease causing cirrhosis. So those two lines of reasoning strongly support the rationale for detecting these patients. A number of guidelines, the American Thoracic Society, European Respiratory Society guidelines in 2003 have endorsed uh, testing all patients with uh, adult patients with symptoms who have COPD for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And yet we know that compliance with those recommendations has been less than perfect, uh, uh, I think contributing to the continued under-recognition of these patients. Our interest in the study uh, was based upon the, the desire to examine whether a delay in diagnosis is associated with adverse clinical impact. The goal was to identify these patients at the moment of first recognition of alpha-1. What period of time transpired between your first symptom related to alpha-1 and the moment of diagnosis? In this particular study, the range was anywhere from zero to as long as 26.8 years. With a median diagnostic delay interval, that's what we call this interval of time between first symptom and first diagnosis of three and a half years in this study. So the essence is number one, uh, that it appears from these preliminary data that delay in diagnosis is associated with worsened clinical status. And it seems logical to presume that on that basis, uh, that this is yet another impetus to make the diagnosis of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency at an earlier time in the patient's natural history so that appropriate interventions can be made. Again, as the guidelines suggest, every patient with COPD should be tested for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency with a serum level and a genotype in order to characterize this patient's risk. Most of these patients, of course, most COPD patients, will not have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Only 2 or 3 percent will be found to have it. But for those 2 or 3 percent, that diagnosis is highly impactful. And so that's the essential takeaway.